strong, if it binds even stronger, the kinetics should get slower. The problem is that this is actually not true. The hydrogen is not binding stronger. What's happening is that OH is binding weaker. So there's been some very, very detailed theory from Mike Janix and Mark Coburn's group explaining that this peak shift is actually because of alkali cations. The adsorbed cations will interact with the surface water that weakens the OH binding and pushes the peak to the right. Now, uh, there are a couple consequences for this. First of all, is that that hydrogen uh, UPD, the hydrogen adsorption, is actually a competitive adsorption of OH and desorption of H. So we have a two species site here, uh, two, uh, sorry, a single site competitive adsorption, um, which means that instead of saying H add, I should be saying H OH exchange. All right, so that's kind of a nomenclature thing. The other thing that we need to think about is that OH is on the surface. And so if OH is changing, then that could mean, that could explain why the kinetics are so different at high and low pH. Um, so there's very strong evidence that OH is there. Uh, platinum ruthenium is the most active alkaline hydrogen oxidation catalyst. Uh, there's been some in-situ spectroscopy that says that OH is there. There's all the theory. Um, but just because it's there doesn't mean it's interact. It's uh, doing something. Um, but some people have said it does. So this is from a series of fairly high-profile papers almost 10 years ago now where they pointed out that um, from argon, if OH has to be involved with the reaction, that could be why the reaction is slow in base. Um, water is the source of protons in base. Protons are the source of protons in acid. So water has to split. That could be slow. We need strong OH to make that happen. And look, if we put traditional clusters, mostly nickel, on platinum 111, the reaction gets a lot faster. So this idea of the bifunctional mechanism got quite a lot of attention in literature, and um, it's something that we wanted to explore further. So this has been a lot of details. I hope that what I've convinced you at least some of is that there's many unanswered questions in alkaline hydrogen electrolysis, even on platinum. Um, is adsorbed hydroxide a reaction intermediate? Why are the kinetics so different in acid and base? And the way that my talk title alludes to, um, what can we do to describe kinetics that are beyond adsorption? We know adsorption energy, but as I'm going to get to in the talk, that's not enough. We're looking for something that can help us predict rates beyond that. So these are some of the questions we're going to try to answer, and there are three parts to my talk. Uh, first, as I'm going to talk about adsorbed hydroxide to see if it really is an intermediate or if it's a spectator. The second part, we'll be looking at the role of solvent dynamics, starting to look at these things beyond adsorption, and then trying to narrow in on that, what do electric fields do? This is something that we're really interested in uh, right now. So let's get started. In order to understand what hydroxide is doing, we're going to do some very classical experiments on electroanalysis, and we're going to combine it with some microkinetic models. I showed you before some of these hypothesized mechanisms. I'm writing them all down here. We have a direct pathway where OH is a spectator. It's adsorbed, but it's not doing anything. And we have an indirect, which is also called the bifunctional pathway, where OH is an active intermediate, and water recombination um, could be a slow step. This is a lot of steps. Let's narrow it down. We're just going to look at the Volmer step. Because we're doing platinum uh, electrochemistry, we can actually use those peaks that I talked about on slide three to look at the kinetics of just the intermediate of H and OH formation. We don't have to look at the whole reaction step. So if I do that, I can simplify my reaction scheme quite a bit. And I can see that there's two pathways. One of them is this direct, where OH is a spectator. I have my two steps here. One of them is my indirect, where OH is actually an adsorption. It's actually an intermediate. And the key difference I want to point out here is that this one is actually a chemical step. So step three here is not electrochemical. So we're going to look, uh, do microkinetic modeling. We do butler volmer expressions for rate. We turn that equilibrium potential into a free energy adsorption and a configurational entropy. And then we do some algebra, sort out that we get some rate constant and an adsorption-free energy in the kinetic term. 
put it together with a transient site balance and Faraday's law, put it into a computer and solve. Um, but the thing about models like this is that they are only as good as the data you can fit them with. Fortunately, I work with Josh Snyder, who does single crystal measurements, and he got some really nice clean data where we see um, adsorption peaks for platinum 110 in a variety of um, electrolytes. So you can see here the black is perchloric acid, uh, the red is lithium hydroxide, the blue is potassium hydroxide, and as my peak shifts to the right, I can use that to correspond to the hydroxide adsorption strength. So it's the weakest in potassium hydroxide and the strongest in acid. So that's very good. Um, let's see what our model says. And the model, unsurprisingly, says that either mechanism can describe the equilibrium peaks. If we do our voltammetry at a slow scan rate, we see that the peaks are pretty symmetric. The oxidation and the reduction are basically the same potential. Um, there's no, there's no overpotential, which is consistent with the slow rate. So you can't determine any kinetic data from this. You can only look at thermal, and either model can fit. So that's not good. But the thing about a model is that the fitting parameter can tell you something about how good it is. Um, and in this case, it matters. Uh, only the direct mechanism values make sense. If we look at the direct mechanism where OH is a spectator, we can fit our data with values that are reasonably consistent with DFT predictions. If we fit our indirect mechanism, we can get the OH adsorption to match, but then we have to make the equilibrium constant for this um, dissociation reaction about uh, 1,000. Um, as we know, equilibrium constants can be anything, but in this case, uh, we know that water self ionizes with an equilibrium constant of 10 to the minus 14. So there's a surface here. Surfaces can change things a lot, but 17 orders of magnitude is still a lot to ask for that number to change. So this is not a nail in the coffin, right? Because we know that equilibrium constants can vary so much and surfaces can change things so much, but it doesn't support the direct, the indirect pathway. So that's a thermo. The thermo says either one could work, but probably direct. Um, we have kinetic data. And if we start looking at the different rate dependence of the voltammetry, we see that the peak potentials start to get farther apart. And this is consistent with what we know about electroanalysis. You can think of that um, flow in a pipe analogy. On the left hand in base, sorry, uh, we have a bigger difference. And that corresponds to a pipe maybe that's bent or lots of fouling. It takes a bigger pressure drop to drive a higher flow. On the right, we have acid, and you can see that the peaks more or less line up. That's consistent with the smooth pipe. It takes very little driving force to drive flow in either direction. If we compare this to the lithium case, uh, you can see that the peak potential splitting is even bigger. So you can think of that as a very dirty old fouled pipe. These plots are a little bit hard to look at on their own, so I'm going to condense them into this peak current density versus peak splitting. As you move to the right, you have slower kinetics, and you can see that the fastest kinetics are in acid, where the strongest OH is, but there's not really a strong consistency between the OH adsorption strength and the kinetic rate. So what does our model say about that? Well, we can use it to predict different kinetic trends with the OH adsorption energy. If I fit my model with OH adsorption being the slow step, I see that increasing the hydroxide binding strength should give me faster kinetics um, because of that exponential term in the, in the rate expression, uh, which is not what the what experiments say. This is true whether I go through the direct or the indirect pathway. If OH is the rate limiting step, then stronger OH should not give me faster kinetics. If I make the direct pathway where H is limiting, then I get stronger hydroxide gives me slower kinetics, and this agrees with experiment. The model also picks up some of these subtleties like the asymmetry in the peaks, which is kind of interesting, and we could talk more about why that is. Uh, the reason for this is actually pretty straightforward. Um, if we have stronger OH binding, we're going to have fewer empty sites. If we have fewer empty sites, then the exchange current density is lower, and that's why stronger OH is making 
the kinetic slower for this reaction. Um, it makes sense when you think about it, but you have to go into the details to see why. Uh, and then just for the sake of completeness, let's look at the dissociation limiting case. Here, our model looks completely crazy compared to the experiment. Um, it doesn't match at all. And the reason for that is that if this OH and H dissociation step is limiting, this is not an electrochemical step. This is purely chemical. That means that the voltammetry is very, very different because it's not affected by voltage in the way that standard electrochemical reactions are. So if we take all these things together, um, we're pretty sure that it's the direct pathway. OH is a spectator. It is not an active participant because the parameters are inconsistent with literature and it has the wrong qualitative kinetic trend with hydroxin adsorption energy. So we are pretty confident about this, um, but there's some other things to think about. Um, this is just for hydrogen and hydroxide adsorption. It doesn't think about the whole reaction step, which is HER and HOR. And there's some interesting things. We talked about lithium versus potassium. In lithium, the Volmer step, putting hydrogen on the surface is slower, but the overall rate of HER, HOR is faster. I also didn't talk about putting um, clusters on the surface or transition metals, where we know that HER changes, but HOR doesn't. So there's these two site things. There's the whole reaction versus just the Volmer step. Um, we tried to model pretty much all of them. And for pretty much all of them, we got the same answer, which is that OH binding could not explain any of these trends. No matter what rate limiting step we picked, no matter which pathway we picked, um, we just couldn't get it to match based on these thermodynamic coverage effects. Uh, and so what we took away from this was that the thermodynamic binding energies are insufficient descriptors for hydrogen in base. Um, so it's not only about adsorption, it has to also be about kinetics, about the solution, about everything else besides just the strength of adsorption on the surface. Now, in this particular case of OH, um, we actually have the answer. Uh, somebody else figured it out, but I want to share it with you. It turns out that delta GOH does scale with the transition state barrier, even though OH is not a product or a reactant. Um, you expect a, a BEP relationship for this indirect pathway, or the OH is actively participating. But it turns out that it also Transition state all activation energy also scales with the direct pathway where OH is just a spectator because the transition state happens to look very similar. So this is also from Coper's group and um, it's very recent. It's a really nice paper. Uh, I thought it, so we can understand why OH matters, but it turns out that it's all kinetics. It's not a BEP relationship that is normally seen. All right, so let's go back to the outline. We want to know what OH is doing on the surface. The spectator, adsorption alone is not enough. So what can we look at beyond adsorption? Well, one thing we're gonna look at is solvent dynamics. And the way that I'm gonna do that is by a combination of CO displacement. We're gonna do kinetic modeling again, and we're also gonna bring in some isotope experiments. So this is a hypothesis um, from originally Coper's group. A couple of people have picked it up. It says that water is more fluid at the potential of zero charge. So at some potential, all the water dipoles will line up just right, and it will be a net zero. And the hypothesis is that when you're at that zero, it can move around very fast. If all the waters are aligned, H up or H down, it's going to be more rigid and hard to move. And that uh, distance, that rigidity, is going to be described by the difference between the voltage that we're at and the voltage that is the potential of, of zero charge. There's some evidence for this um, in the form of some laser temperature jump experiments um, and some other techniques. We tried to go after this as well in our own way. The way we tried to do it was by measuring the potential of zero charge with CO displacement. So the way that that works is you have your platinum electrode and your electrolyte. You bubble in carbon monoxide. That's going to bind very strongly to platinum and push up anything else out of the way. So if that thing is an anion, the CO pushes it away, and now we've lost negative charge. That's a negative current. 
And if you do this at different potentials, you'll see the current go from negative to positive. You integrate the area under that curve, you get a charge, you look at the potential at which the charge goes from negative to positive and call that the zero. So we did that um, on a variety of single crystals with and without uh, surface clusters because we know that they change things. And we saw that putting ruthenium and nickel on the surface shifted that PZC closer to zero, which is where we would want it to be according to this hypothesis. What we also saw though was that that shift was surface sensitive. So it had a big effect on platinum 111. You can see that here, the black crossover goes from too high to measure down to 0.1. But on one know it only goes from 0.26 to 0.15. So we decided to use that surface sensitivity to design some fancy catalysts. We got our friend Yi Jing Kang at Northwestern University to make us some platinum octahedra with lots and lots of 111 facets and not very many 110. And we saw that when we put ruthenium on those, it was much more effective than when we looked at a regular old platinum catalyst. So that's great, it seems to work, but um, we don't actually know that this is this PZC solvent dynamics. So that's what we tried to go after. And um, what we tried to do it was with kinetic isotope measurements. So. This is a technique that's really common in organic chemistry. It's not as common in electrocatalysis. Basically, you take your reactant, you substitute the H with the D, and you see how much slower it is. And that can tell you things about you know, which stretching is limiting or which rotation, or if it's um, whether the which hydrogen on your organic molecule is reacting. So we did it with water. We replaced our water with deuterium oxide. And um, tried to measure the how much slower the kinetics were in acid and base. That ratio, the rate constant of hydrogen over the rate constant of deuterium is called the KIE, kinetic isotope effect. So we did this on single crystals. Um, we did it with different solvents. We did it with different cations. And we did it either under argon saturation or hydrogen saturation. And this is important. It's going to be very important in about two slides that this is H2, not D2. So what do we see? Um, in acid, we didn't see very much. Everything's too fast to measure. Almost everything's too fast to measure, and that's kind of what we knew going in. Uh, HER is too fast to measure. It's all transport limited on 111. Same thing on 110. On 110, the hydrogen oxidation is too fast to measure. It's also transport limited. But on 111, the hydrogen oxidation is not limited by transport. You can see that by the difference between the blue and the other lines, but the blue with the black and the orange, which is D and H are basically the same. So our isotope effect there is none, can't measure it. How about in base? In base, you see a bigger difference. On 111, you can see the red is our deuterium, the blue is our hydrogen. It's different, same thing here, same thing here. Um, but the differences depend on the surface. We did some transport corrections for the hydrogen oxidation region and worked out that our kinetic isotope effect was anywhere from one to two, one to two and a half. Now on platinum, we know that OH is adsorbing in the hydrogen relevant region, and that's gonna cause some competition for sites. Uh, we need to correct for that, so we did some corrections. I'm going to skip through this because we don't need the details. But basically, after we did all this, we got some nice clean kinetic measurements only. Um, and we saw that our KIE was electrolyte sensitive. And this tells us that this is not some simple shift of the pKa going from hydrogen to deuterium. We also saw that it was surface sensitive. It's a different number on 111 and 110, which tells us it's not mass transport. Something different is happening um, on these different surfaces and in different electrolytes. So what can the absolute value tell us? Well, it's a little hard to interpret, but it tells us something that is two things that are pretty important. First one is that this is a really complicated reaction. If we just look at the stretching energy of the platinum H and the platinum uh, for this water bond, we would expect 
a kinetic isotope effect of about 11. And what we're measuring is closer to 2. So that is tells us that this is not a simple uh, organic chemistry reaction. The other thing that we can look at, and this is, I think, the one that we really want to pay attention to, is that hydrogen oxidation KIE, because this is purely a solvent effect. Remember how I told you we were only bubbling in hydrogen, not deuterium? That means that the adsorbed intermediate is H, and the solvent around it is D, and you can see that illustrated here in water and in D2O. And in acid, there's no difference between these two steps. They are equally fast. Our KIE was one, and we measured that with pretty good certainty. In base, even though we have the same um, general thing, we have H and D, our KIE is 2.5. And so what we're seeing here is that the water is immeasurably fast in acid, and in base, it's not. So the water network matters only in base, and that could support the hypothesis about solvent dynamics and PZC. Right. So the story so far, we're pretty sure about OH. We see that there are very different water dynamics in acid and base. In acid, they're very fast. In base, they're slow, possibly even limiting. Why is that? So let's look at that hypothesis about electric field in a little bit more detail. I'm going to bring in a new character, and that new character is caffeine. We found out, somewhat serendipitously, that caffeine makes HER and HOR much, much faster in base. And this is, quite frankly, we don't know why. Uh, if we put a little bit of caffeine into our electrolyte, we see that the HER is much, much faster and the HOR is much, much faster. Well, why is that? It's not obvious. Um, caffeine is definitely blocking surface sites. We can see that because the OH adsorption desorption is suppressed. We can see that the H adsorption desorption is suppressed, but it doesn't look like the peak potentials are shifting very much, if at all. So we also, um, it doesn't seem like it's a thermodynamic adsorption energy effect, uh, but it definitely has a big effect on base. And something surprising is that it makes the kinetics slower in acid. So you can see here, the dotted lines are with caffeine. The solid lines are no caffeine. I just showed you the purple curve on the previous slide. That's pH 13. If you look at pH one, you can see that adding caffeine actually makes it slower, consistent with blocking sites. If we look at all the pHs in between, it seems like whenever you cross over from acid to base, like down here, caffeine makes it better in base and slower in acid. So it's consistent across the board, faster in base, slower in acid, doesn't change the um, hydrogen or hydroxide adsorption peaks. What's going on? Well, we can take it back to that hypothesis about the water structure being more fluid at the potential zero charge. Uh, I'm not going to show all the data here because I want to have time for discussion, but it seems like there is a correlation between the EPZC and the kinetics with caffeine. We also have that data uh, correlating PZC on ruthenium oxide with platinum. We also have that support from the kinetic isotope effect measurements that say that KIE is fast in acid and slow in base. However, there's some other things that we don't think are very consistent, um, which is that OH adsorption is always fast. We also have this idea that if the field is very strong, putting more salt in should screen that field. And we did those experiments and they showed no difference. So there's a lot going for and a lot going against. Um, I want to just show one more observation that we're still trying to understand. And that is that we did the kinetic isotope measurements with caffeine. Uh, and this, I think, shows something really interesting, which is that caffeine makes the kinetics faster, but it makes the water less acid-like. And let me explain what I mean by that. Remember, um, if I go back, if I showed you before that we don't have any KIE in acid, we do have a KIE in base. The red shows the acid with no caffeine. The orange shows the acid with caffeine. 
And even though the kinetics were slower, we still were not able to measure any kinetic isotope effect. It was the same with water and deuterium for hydrogen oxidation, which as a solvent is still too fast to measure, even though the reaction has gotten slower. For the black curve and the blue curve, the black curve was is hydrogen oxidation in water for base. We saw that even though the adsorbed intermediate is H, the rate of reaction is slower in D, and that's the black curve. If we put caffeine in, that rate gets that ratio gets even higher. And so what that's saying is that even though the caffeine is making the reaction fast, it's making the solvent even more of a limiting factor. And so that's kind of summed up in this plot here. So you can see no difference between the reds, bigger difference between the blues. All right, so I brought up a lot of questions at the beginning, um, and I think we've answered some of them. Um, we're really sure about this one. Hydroxide is not a reaction intermediate on platinum 111 or platinum 110. OH is a spectator. It happens slow at the transition state, and that's why you do sometimes get this correlation between rates and OH adsorption energy, but it's not because of classic BEP relationships. Why are the kinetics so different in acid and base? Well, we're still working on it, but we're pretty sure the wonder, water is different. Water is slower in base. Other reasons could be possible, of course, but this is one of them. And then the last question, um, what are the kinetic descriptors beyond adsorption? Again, we're still not working on that. We're still working on that. Um, I think that finding these is the really the next great challenge for fundamental electrocatalysis. And regardless of what the reasons are, organic additives like caffeine can do some interesting things, and it's keeping us busy. So with that, I want to acknowledge uh, everybody who actually did this work. So this is our group here. Um, Luis did a lot of work on this project. Uh, he's on the job market, if you know. Anyone who wants to hire, he's great. Uh, Dr. Saad Intikab was a, a PhD student in my collaborator, Josh Snyder's group. And I'd also like to thank all of you for your attention today. I'm happy to take questions. Hey, great. Thanks so much for that interesting um, and really deep analysis of hydrogen evolution. So for those of you who just joined us, please enter your questions into the chat. And Nitish, I hope, is here. Or is, yeah. Yes, will moderate the discussion. So, and there's, there's already a question I can see that. Yes, so yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Maureen, for the talk. So now we can take some questions. So I have a question here from Zen Ben, uh, which is about the microkinetic modeling. So in your microkinetic model, it seems like you use the adsorption energy of H and OH as a. Uh, do we also not consider the barrier? So apart from the adsorption energies, do you also look at the barriers in your microkinetic model? So in the so what we did was um, the barrier would be get in, would be uh, encompassed by that rate constant in our model. So there is an activation. Sorry, the adsorption energy ends up falling out into a prefactor because of the way we did the algebra. But yes, the barrier should be built into the rate constant, which we treat as a fitting parameter. Great. Um, yeah, I think Mega can unmute. You know. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, what I want to ask is, uh, did you try uh, any other molecule apart from caffeine? Perhaps. Yes. Okay, what are, what are those? Um, a bunch. Okay. So um, I would have to get the list from you from, from the students, but it seems like there are a bunch out there that do stuff. Caffeine seems to be the best so far. Uh, what is common among these molecules? So to my knowledge, this is not something that's done that commonly. Um, I think that- but, but like, is there a characteristic molecule which show this? Like why those bunch? Why? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. Okay. 
perhaps I think uh, there could be some explicit participation of these molecules if I can get to know what are some of those molecules, some of the other ones, and maybe maybe something something. Yeah, like so I mean that's that's something we're working on now. So we're screening a lot of molecules. We had a little bit of a setback with the lab closures last year. Mm. Um, but we've seen that there are a number of, of caffeine derivatives that enhance HER, HOR. None of them are as effective as caffeine. Of course, organic chemistry is very rich. It is hard to try all the molecules. Um, so that doesn't mean that something couldn't be better. Um, I don't think it's a PKA thing because we're at such strong acid and strong base that it wouldn't seem to, I don't think that that's going to be dynamic. Uh, we looked that up. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like the caffeine is blocking the sites. So that should actually make things fast. Like mm -hmm. the, the numbers we measure are actually even higher. So the, the actual kinetic rate is even higher than what we measure because we are measuring a block site as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's a real question. Like what is this molecule doing? So, so the other molecules are also caffeine derivatives. There are some caffeine derivatives and they seem to do stuff that is good, but not as good. Okay, so caffeine derivatives are not as good as caffeine. So yes, caffeine so far, the ones that we've tried, there, there are many caffeine derivatives. All right, thank you. <clears throat> oh. uh, Thomas, did you want to ask something? Oh, no, sorry, I just uh, my mind. Yeah, okay. Uh, we have a question from James Sto. Uh Thanks for the talk. So how much should we read into the double minima shape of the KIE versus potential plot on slide 63? Uh, so the double minima being, uh, in my opinion, not very much. You know, we, we're doing single crystals. We're being very careful. It took a long time to get measurements that were clean enough to trust. Um, when you start going to deuterated solvents and especially deuterated salts, the purity goes way down. So you have to be like very careful about contaminants. Um, but I still think that you're talking about like this little dip here is probably noise. Um, yeah, so I had a question uh, in the plot that you showed, uh, I think it's on slide. Uh, well, I don't know the slide, but the, the plot with the, the pH, right? Where you go from pH one to 13 with the caffeine and then without the, yeah. um, the caffeine. So, I was wondering there, one is, uh, how are you changing the uh, pH? So do you have uh, buffers or do you just change the ionic strength of, of uh, whatever electrolyte you're using? And also when you do that, are you keeping the ionic strength constant? Are you also changing the ionic strength? So this is going to be, I believe, constant ionic strength and we keep it there with, um, you know, potassium perchlorate or something like that. And we do that because if you don't buffer it at all, it's the resistance is too high to measure anything. If you put in some kind of buffer like borate or phosphate, then you've got all the absorption of the anion. Uh, and so, yes, absolutely. The interfacial pH is not three. The interfacial pH is not five to nine to 11. It's the interfacial pH is whatever it is. The thing that we can actually learn from here, I think is just that qualitatively, HER, HOR is faster in base with caffeine and slower in acid with caffeine. Yeah. Trying to get quantitative at near neutral pH is really hard. Yeah. And I was wondering, do you like, do you also check for any cation dependence here? Is there any cation dependence? Like when you have the caffeine, if you have like potassium versus cesium or something, do you see something? Um, I think Luis did that. I don't remember the answer. I'd have to check with him. Okay. okay. Yeah, all, all the differences between cations at constant pH are much different, much smaller than differences between acid and base, I can tell you that. Yeah, so that's true. But I, I'm, I'm wondering, yeah, like at a constant pH, can you do lithium versus cesium? Like yeah, that? can it help tell you about like what's actually changing? Um, if we did it, the answer wasn't obvious. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so there's a question from Jay, Jay Yoon Ryu. Uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. Can you comment on the difference between uh, 
potential is zero free charge and total charge. To my knowledge, field experiments can only measure total charge, potential is zero total charge. But field theory relies on pH independence of the potential is zero free charge, which is based on laser induced heat sump experiments that measure. Okay. Yeah, so great question. Uh, you, you're on the literature for this. Um, yes, so free charge versus total charge. CO displacement place measures uh, total charge. What we can do is um, you measure total charge and then you use the voltammetry to extrapolate to free charge. This is like, um, I think Juan Filou has a couple of papers about the method. So we did that with and without caffeine and the free charge with caffeine goes straight close to zero, which is really in support of this, you know, field mechanism. Um, but then when we did the KIE measurements, it seems like that was less consistent because if you have, if the water dynamics at, um, are what's limiting and it's just a field thing, making the PZC close to zero in base should make the water very fast, which means you shouldn't see a KIE. But we saw the KIE got bigger, not smaller. And that's what we thought was really confusing and makes us think that it's less likely to be field. Sorry, can I just clarify? So the, the field effects you're referring to have to do with the rigidity, right, of, of the water network. Is, is that the idea? Yeah. So the field argument, and this is uh, not my original idea, but it, it is like very elegant and it seems to make sense, is that if the water is facing a strong field, it's going to have a harder time flipping around and moving, which seems like could be true, but it's actually that part is also not directly proven. Yeah. What we do have is evidence that says at the conditions where the water should be more neutral and experience a lower field, we also have stronger, faster kinetics. Right. So there is some data about a correlation, but I think the data for causation is much weaker. I guess maybe in, in relation to that, so if that's the case, then the PZZ should be a descriptor with which you, you actually mentioned in, in your talk. I'm sorry, I'm just like so many details. Yeah. But if that's the case, then would the pH effect be um, related to the PZZ of a given metal surface then, if, if this is what the, the pH effect arises from? So I don't know. I, I think, yeah. like, you know, I, I would kind of point out at this, there's descriptors and then there's, you know, causal descriptors. And we saw, you know, that OH adsorption, even though it's not a causal descriptor, right, it actually practically it is a descriptor for some surfaces just because it's it's correlated. Mm -hmm. And that could happen with PZC too, at a potential of zero free charge or potential of zero total charge because they happen to describe the same thing or be influenced by the same thing. Um, the question is, one, is that true? And two, um, why, if so? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a difficult question. Yeah. I think what we can do, actually, there's one more question from Mega. Maybe Mega, if you can unmute and ask it, and then. Um, yes, um, so that 11 versus 2.5 KID, that factor, um, uh, KH by KD, that's why. This one? Uh, uh, yeah, in the next one, where you explain it, where you try to explain the logic, why we, why is it 2.5 and not 11? Yes. Uh, the next one. So there's two KIEs here. So we have the, um, the primary KIE. This is what we expect to be 11. So if I switch out this H for a D, then um, the, the well of that vibration should be deeper. And so the transition rate should be higher and the reaction rate should be slower. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have a lot of organic chemistry telling us about. Mm -hmm. Should be 11, but that assumes that nothing else changes. And so if it's a lot lower than 11, that just says that like that stretching is not the only thing. There's more things going on. So, we kind of already knew that. We knew that this wasn't just a straightforward 
gas phase, you know, atmospheric chemistry problem. So that's not very helpful on its own. But then we have the other kind of KIE, which is the secondary KIE or the solvent KIE. And that one is informative because here we've only changed one thing. We've only changed the solvent. We haven't changed the intermediate because remember it, we're, we're bubbling in hydrogen, not deuterium. And so if we do HOR, we're oxidizing that gas or the dissolves gaseous hydrogen into water. So all my surface should be covered with H. It shouldn't be covered with D. Here, um, the solvent KIEs in the literature are usually like 5%, 10%, like much, much lower. And we're getting a factor of two, which says that our, our solvent is much more limiting than whatever those organic chemistry reactions were. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, we have one more question, but Hector, we're, we're going to have a meeting after, so maybe we can talk about it then because we're, we're just slightly over time already. Um, thank you. So for, um, so thank you all for attending. And for those of you at DTU who would like to join in a discussion, in about 10 minutes from now, just email me if you don't have the link to do it. So thanks again, Maureen. And yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. So let's talk about this some more um, in about 10 minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. So okay. we'll sign off and uh, see you again. Yes, great. And great. Thomas, thank you, Maureen. Thomas Gleegod, very nice talk. Oh, hi, Thomas. <laughs> yeah. And I see actually there's a, a few people you probably know in the audience that. Yeah. I not call on them to put them on the spot. <laughs> see you in 10 minutes. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone. See you in a couple of weeks. Yeah.